Good morning, good morning. We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 7 through 13. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. Just to get a running start, I want to read verses 1 through 6. Provide a little context for us. Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 13. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. Verse 4, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And now our text this morning, verse 7. Of which I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in which we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to gather here this morning to study your word. It is a high calling to teach your word, and it is a high privilege to open your word, to have it in our native tongue, to have the freedom to worship you this morning through songs and hymns and spiritual songs and to worship you in your word. You make yourself known in your word. You change lives through your word. You sanctify through your word. You build up and encourage through your word. You correct, rebuke, and exhort through your word. Father, your word is our meat and our drink. So may you do great work this morning through your word. These are your people and these are your words. And Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul who penned these words so many years ago that they have such application today for us here this morning. We pray for all those who are traveling this Memorial Day. We ask for your traveling mercies upon them. We thank you for what Memorial Day represents, the men and women in the armed forces, all of those who sacrifice day in and day out to guard the wall and protect us in this country. And we thank you for the men and women who have sacrificed the ultimate price of life to provide the freedoms that we that we enjoy and sadly often take for granted. So may you bless them and may you bless their families. And we ask that you would bless your word in Christ's name, amen. What do you think of when you hear the word church? What is it that comes to mind? I think for many people it's the definition that Webster gives of church. If you look up the definition of church, it says it's a noun and it's a building used for public Christian worship. Or another definition would be the public worship of God or a religious service in such a building. And I think if we're honest, when we hear the word church, many of us think of, most of the world particularly, thinks of a religious building, a physical structure. Probably not Herb's house, but a physical edifice of some sort, usually with a steeple, stained glass windows, maybe some candles. 
the Roman Catholics would define church in this way, quote, a visible society of baptized Christians professing the same faith under the authority of the invisible head Christ, doesn't sound too bad yet, and the authority of the visible head, the Pope, and the bishops in communion with him. Growing up, I thought there was several different kinds of Christians. I didn't understand the concept of being born again. I was really never taught that. And going to church for me was like going to the gym or going to school, going to some thing during the week. It didn't have any special significance in particular. It was something that you did, something that made you more religious, more pious perhaps. And perhaps you've heard of the story about a gentleman who was walking by a pile of rocks. There was a number of workmen working on this pile of rocks. And as the man walked around looking at this pile of rocks and seeing the men working away, he stopped and asked one of the workers, Sir, what, what are you doing? The man says, Well, what's it look like I'm doing? I'm chiseling stone. And so the man didn't like that answer particularly, so he kept walking and he came to the second worker and he said, sir, what, 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 are, you, what are you doing here with all these stones? And the man says, I'm earning a living. Stop bothering me. So undeterred, the man kept walking around the construction site and finally he found a third worker who had a sledgehammer in his hand and he asked the man, sir, what are you doing with these rocks? And the man put down the sledgehammer and he smiled and he looked at the man and then he looked upward and he said, I'm building a cathedral for the glory of God. And I think you get the point. All three men were doing the same thing, but when it comes to church, so many have that different view, don't they? Some don't know why they come to church. In Dallas, I grew, up, you know, I grew up in the Northeast in Dallas, as Lawson would call it, the, bu the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's, it's a given that you go to church. Everybody goes to church. You go to church, you go to brunch, that's just what you do on a Sunday. Doesn't necessarily mean you go to the right church, doesn't necessarily mean that the church is Christian from a biblical perspective, but church is what people do down here. Where I grew up in the Northeast, people don't play church. They either are converted or typically Catholic or they're just unconverted and they don't attend. Some attend church as a job, perhaps maybe a parent or a spouse makes them come. I'm not saying any of you fall into that category, but sometimes we're dragged by the ear to church. Some people go to church because it's good for business. It's a great place to have contacts. The bigger the better. If it's in an affluent neighborhood, that's even better. Perhaps I could make some contacts in business. I can cover my bases, it's part of my religion, maybe it even makes God happy that I attend church. But if you're in the elect, if you have been born again, you understand that the church is the body of Christ. It's the very body of Christ, redeemed by Him for the glory of the Godhead. In the New Testament, the term church is used over 114 times, and it's only used twice in the Gospels, which is interesting. It's, over 20, it's used over 23 times in the book of Acts, as you would expect, as Acts is a book about the beginning of the church. And Paul uses it in his different writings 46 times. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which many of you I know have heard. And it has the idea of literally the called out ones those who have all come from the same lump of dough, those who have been born into Adam, dead in their sin, and God comes and quickens those who, redeem, who are redeemed and calls them out and makes them separate and holy. Those who, by the power and effectual call of Jesus Christ, have put their trust in Him. One of the two times that the word church is used in the Gospels is in the book of Matthew, and I think that's a very instructive passage where Jesus in Matthew 16, 18 says this, upon this rock, speaking to Peter and the apostles, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. 
In that simple verse, we learn three very important things. Number one, the church is built upon a common confession. There's been much debate and much uh, poor theology built upon that word rock, and we don't have time to get into that today, okay? It's Petra and Petras. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. But Peter had just made the confession that Jesus Christ was the Son of the living God. He was the Messiah, the one that had been promised for all eternity. And it's upon that rock, it's upon that statement that Jesus says, I will build my church. That's the common confession of those who are in the body of Christ. Number two, Jesus himself is the architect of that church. He says, I will build my church. Satan has done a masterful job of building his, listen to me, churches. You have Christ scientists, you have the Mormon church, you have the Catholic church, you have Jehovah's Witness, you have on and on and on. Satan has been a master counterfeiter building his churches, plural. But Jesus Christ says, I will build my church, singular. He's the architect. He is the cornerstone. He is the one that men stumble over who miss it. And third, he says, despite Satan's best efforts to attack, to thwart, to confuse, to discourage, Christ's promise here is that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is what Paul will say later in Ephesians as he shows later in Ephesians 6, which we'll study in several weeks, Christ has a deep love for his church. He uses the analogy of marriage to show just how much Christ loves the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, just a few chapters later, he says in verse 25 and following, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church. This incidentally is one of the greatest verses on limited atonement. Christ did not die for all. He died for the church for those who are the body of Christ. He says, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And so we see in the whole New Testament, what matters to Christ, what matters to the Father, what matters to the Holy Spirit is the church. That is his namesake. That is where God is working. And it's not just the visible church. We understand, don't we, that there's a visible church and then there's an invisible church. There are those who attend church and sit in the pews and then there are those who are truly redeemed. Those who are truly born again, those who are truly part of the church, they're in the white water of what Christ is doing. The other ones are the visible church, the unconverted, those who come to church and fill a seat but don't know the one for whom we come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we come to our passage this morning, Paul wants to make certain that the Ephesians understand God's plan for the church. You remember when I first kicked this book off, and did the introduction, I said one of the great themes that runs throughout Ephesians is about the church. And we see all sorts of examples that Paul gives in this book about the church. And so we come to this passage this morning, which is greatly concerned about the church. God has a clear plan, and it's only when we understand this plan that we can deal with our tribulations in life. And I know none of you in here have tribulations. Our family does, but I know none of you do. But it's when we understand the plan for the church that we can deal with these tribulations in a godly and biblical perspective with a godly and biblical mindset. And so just before we jump in, I want to set the context just briefly. Last week, Austin Duncan uh, taught the beginning of chapter 3, but in chapter 2, what did we see? We saw the unfolding of this mystery, which we're going to talk more about this morning that Christ has brought both Jew and Gentile together. He has reconciled in one both groups that were formerly at enmity. The Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world, and the Jews 
were in the inner sanctum, if you will, who thought that the salvation was all because they were Jewish. And God has reconciled these two groups that were formerly at enmity. In verse 16 of chapter 2, Paul says this, that he might reconcile Christ, might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Last week in chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, Austin spoke clearly about the mystery of God making Gentiles fellow heirs, bringing them into one body, something which Paul will expound more on this morning. And so as we come to the text this morning, you might guess that the title that I've given this is God's plan for the church. God's plan for the church. And it really breaks out well into three parts. First, in verse 7 and 8, we see the minister. Paul, the minister. Verse 9 through 12, number 2, we see the mystery. The minister. 2, the mystery. And finally, in verse 13, we see the motive. The minister, the mystery, and the motive. That's where we're headed. First, let's look at verse 7 and 8, the minister. Verse 7 and 8, the minister. And just... Because of the context, I had to pull some from chapter or verse 6 because there's a key word in verse 6 that Austin touched on last week. He was laughing at breakfast that he was going to step on some of my verses, so I'm going to return the favor and grab some of his verses. But at the end of verse 6, we see the words, the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. That word gospel, you should underline, you should highlight, you should circle, of which, Paul says in verse 7, I became a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Well, first, we see it's the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. You've maybe heard the phrase, I'm often laughed at at work because I have a lot of colloquialisms. Maybe it's because I grew up in the Northeast, but... Growing up, we had this phrase called a one-trick pony. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. You go to the, the Barnum and Bailey Circus, and there would be some animals that would be a one-trick pony. They weren't necessarily a pony. They just had one trick. Maybe your dog has one trick. He can roll over when you give him a biscuit. Well, Paul was what I would call a one-trick pony. He had one nail and one hammer, and he hit that nail, and he hit that nail, and he hit that nail, and it was called the gospel. Paul was consumed with the gospel. And he was 100% focused on it. In fact, one of the great verses that you can think of in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says in verses 1 and 2, I did not come to you, brethren, with superiority of speech or wisdom of words. And I can tell you, as a guy up here teaching with a big JV on my sweater, it's really comforting to hear that, okay? Paul says, I'm not some order. I'm not William Jennings Bryant with degrees from Ivy League schools. It didn't matter about superiority of speech. But I proclaim to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the message that Paul preached. That's the message that Paul understood was the power of God. Now, there's so much confusion about what the gospel is in a room of this size, I don't want to take for granted that people understand what the gospel is. So I want you to hold your finger and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This to me is a, is a very quick summary of what the gospel is. If people ask what the gospel is, this is where I take them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Now I make known to you, brethren, he's talking to the believers, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Number one, he's saying, I preach this message. This message is preached. This message is read. This message is spoken. It is a message that is given through a verbal or a reading capacity. And he says, you received it, meaning you didn't just hear me. You received it. Remember, there's three, kind, there's three parts to faith. There's knowledge, assent, and trust. Knowledge, hearing the message, doesn't save you. Assent, understanding that message, doesn't save you. Third, trusting the message. That's what saves. All three. Again, I've said this before. It's the difference between studying about NASA 
becoming an astronaut and then getting in the rocket. That's trust when you get in that rocket and you go to the moon. Number two, look at verse two. By which you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you. Hold fast to what? The gospel. And he's going to tell you what it is here in a minute. Unless you believed in vain. Yes, there are people who believe in vain. They are like the three soils that were not converted. They, they understand the message. They have some taste of the message. They have some assent, but they don't trust it. They don't believe it. Verse 3, I delivered to you. Here it is. As of first importance, he says, if you forget everything I told you, if you remember nothing else, this is the most important thing I taught you, Corinthians, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Last week we took the Lord's Supper and I made the point that Christ had to die. Why? Because sin requires someone die. Either you die for your sins or Christ dies in your place. Those are the only two options. This is not multiple choice. There is no C or D. So he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, Number four, verse four, and that he was buried. Christ had to die and actually was buried. He didn't swoon, as Perkins Theological likes to say down the street here, or some other bad theology. Christ actually died. He was buried. And on the third day rose again according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Peter and the twelve. You can flip back to Ephesians Three. That's the gospel. Those are the salient facts of the gospel. Christ came according to the scriptures. He died according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And the reason that Easter, the reason that the resurrection is so critically important is because it's proof that God the Father accepted the sacrifice of his son. How do we know that? Because if you can remove sin, you remove death. And therefore Christ had to rise. The New Testament says it this way. It was impossible for death to hold him. Why? Because he had paid the penalty for sin. That's the gospel that Paul preached. And my friends, that's the gospel that this world needs to hear. That's the gospel that you and I need to share with our family and our children and our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers. And so the gospel is Christ's key to unlock the sinful heart. It is the key that fits into the door. It's the cure for cancer. It is the power of God unto salvation. It's the greatest need that mankind has, and it's the greatest answer to all of man's questions. I remember as a teenage boy lying in my bed just before I fell asleep, thinking about these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? How can I know God? Is there a God? How can I be right with God? All of those questions can be answered by the gospel. And I'm ashamed to admit, for a couple of years after being converted, I still didn't fully appreciate the power of this message. It is this message that God uses to save sinners. He doesn't save by how many angels dance on the head of a pin. He doesn't save by who married Adam and Eve's brothers. Or he didn't, he didn't, he didn't people ask, well, who, who did Cain and Abel marry is what I meant to say. He doesn't, he doesn't save through those kinds of things. He saves by the gospel. So don't get off track with other anecdotal biblical information. This is the message that God uses to save. And in verse 7, he says he was made a minister. Remember last week, Austin Duncan said this word minister just simply means servant. What was Christ? He was a servant. He didn't, come to serve. he didn't come to be served, but to serve. Same concept. Paul was made a servant. He didn't choose ministry. Ministry chose him. You remember Paul was on the way to Damascus to kill more Christians, to persecute more Christians, to do everything he could to damage the new believers of the way. And yet he was arrested and he was made a minister. Paul calls it a gift. Look at verse 7. A gift of God's grace which was given. This was a gift given from the Lord. We all have a gift once we've been converted or gifts, plural, that God has given us that we're to use for His glory, that we're to use for the benefit of others. Later in chapter 4, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul says this in verse 11 and following, He gave some to be apostles, apostles, 
some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. By not using a gift the Lord has given you, you're robbing your brothers and sisters in the church. Do you realize that? You're not giving us what we need. If you're an ear, a nose, a hand, a foot, we all are part of that body and need to be used for God's glory. Paul's ministry relied on the power of God. He didn't rely on himself. He says this was according to the working of his power, Christ's power. He starts off his magnum opus, Romans, the greatest book he ever penned, by saying this in chapter 1, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. That's the very definition of the book of Romans. That verse 16 and 17, that is, sets the context for the whole book. How is it possible to take a man, Saul of Tarsus, the greatest hater of the Christian church in the New Testament, and make him Paul the Apostle? Well, there's only one explanation, and that's the power of God. How can he take you, a sinner, and make you a saint? The power of God. And so the question is, how many are in ministry today? As we look around the landscape of the church, the church visible, how many are in ministry today that have not been called, that have not been gifted, that have no power, they've been given no grace, they're up there with eloquence of speech. They're up there talking about themselves. And so, what a great testimony we have here in the life of Paul. Verse 8, he says, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Notice he says, I was the least of all the saints. This isn't false humility. Don't mistake this for false humility. Paul's very name meant little. That's what Paul's name meant, little. He never recovered from the notion that he was once an object of God's wrath. He was a Christ hater and that God redeemed him and made him an object of his grace. He never recovered from that. And I pray that everybody in here who's converted would never recover from that either. Humility should be the mark of any true child of God. I must say, when I meet a believer who is arrogant and full of pride, we all have that. I mean, the Puritans used to say, pride's the first thing you put on in the morning, and it's the last thing you take off at night. So don't, make, don't misunderstand me. We all are, have pride. But humility should be at the core of what a believer is. It is part of our DNA if we've been redeemed. What do we have to brag about? And so Paul never got over becoming an object of his grace. John MacArthur says, Humility produces a servant's heart. In Corinthians, he told, Paul told the Corinthians, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. And in his letter to Timothy, he says that he is the chief of sinners. Paul had a right understanding of who he was and he rejoiced for who God had made him. Charles Spurgeon says this, quote, Yet while Paul was thankful for his office, his success in it greatly humbled him. The fuller a vessel becomes, the deeper it sinks in the water. Isn't that good? The fuller a vessel becomes, the deeper it sinks in the water. Idlers may indulge a fond conceit of their abilities, because they are untried and untested. But the earnest worker soon learns his own weakness. If you seek humil humility, try hard work. If you would know your nothingness, attempt something great for Jesus Christ. End of quote. And Paul says further in verse 8, this grace was given. Notice the words he's using here. It was a gift. It was given. It was given. He was the apostle of the Gentiles, but he was also an apostle of grace. Who better to understand grace than one who persecuted and hated the church? He understood more than anybody God's unmerited favor. Paul should have gone to hell. He knew that. He said, I'd rather go to hell than see my brethren go to hell. 
And so he, understand, he understood more than anybody God's unmerited favor. In Corinthians, in chapter 4, he says this, And what do you have that you have not received? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you haven't received it? He's telling the church, there's no place for pride. Everything you have is a gift. This Damascus Road conversion changed him forever. And I hope, as I said before, we don't forget what life was B.C., before Christ. May we never forget that. And notice he preached to the Gentiles. Paul was an apostle of grace, yes, but he was also the great apostle to the Gentiles. He preached to them the gospel, but notice in verse 8, he preached to them the unfathomable riches of Christ. That word is, that phrase is a sermon unto itself. We can't even begin to plumb the depths of what unfathomable riches of Christ is. It's all that Christ is, the Lamb of God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the promised Redeemer, the Messiah, the door, the way, the truth, the life, the light. It's all of those things. It's all that we have in Christ, the unfathomable riches of Christ. This Greek word for unfathomable riches literally means that which can't be traced. It's inexhaustible. It's endless. It's too great to fully grasp. But to appreciate the riches that we have in Christ, we have to understand the poverty that we have without Christ. Does that make sense? You can't understand the riches unless you understand the poverty. And in chapter 2, you remember Jay Lenningham and Mark Becker talked in chapter 2 about the fact that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made you alive in Christ Jesus. You were dead and now you're alive. It was because of the power of God, it was because it was given, it was because it was a gift, and now you have been brought into the body of Christ. Jew, Gentile, slave, Scythian, there is no difference. We're all one in Christ. And so this is what's wrapped up in this unfathomable riches. We were destined for hell, and then Jesus came and died in our place. And yet, how many in this world spend their lives in the poverty of this world? You think about the... the the prodigal, standing in the pigsty, eating the pig slop. That's what the men of this world do outside of Christ. They are filled with the poverty of this world, taking in as much as they could, as much as they can, storing up treasure where moth and rust and thieves break in and steal and destroy, and yet all the while spurning the riches of Christ, just disregarding the majesty and riches that Christ can bestow. I want you to imagine if after we get done here this morning, a bus pulls up, and as we load the bus, we all drive down to the Dallas Federal Reserve. And for the rest of the day, we're taken into the vaults, and they say to us, you can take as much money as you can until 8 o'clock tonight. Grab as much as you can. Fill bag after bag with as much money as you possibly can. Would you not get on the bus? Would you get to the Fed and then stand in the corner and say, I have no interest in that. I don't want any money. I don't have any interest in grabbing as much money as I can. Of course you wouldn't do that. Nobody would do that. And yet that doesn't even compare to what we're talking about. All the money in the world is finite. There's only so much money in the world. Christ's riches are unfathomable. They're untraceable. They're infinite. And yet men spurn them as if they wouldn't go on the bus to the Dallas Federal Reserve. It's mind-boggling. The, the weight and the blindness of sin is astounding. And so we see Paul the minister. Paul the minister. And make no mistake, as I said before, each one of you in this room who have been born again are a minister. Are a minister. And so the Paul the minister, look, next to Paul, uh, that we see the mystery, verse 9 through 12, the mystery. 
and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. Paul, in this ministry that God had given him, brought to light this mystery. Now, I won't labor this because Austin touched on it last week, but this mystery is simply something that was hidden before that has now been revealed. That's it. It's something that we didn't know that God has now made known. And it's only because of his, excuse me, revelation that we know it. And so this is what we've been studying since chapter 2. The mystery of Christ saving the Gentiles in addition to the Jews. Calvary and the cross that he meted out was for both Jews and Gentiles. That's what this word administration points to. Some of you in your translation in verse 9, if you have an NASB or an NIV, the word will be administration. If you're using a New King James, you might have the word fellowship. But the Greek word here is koinonia. Koinonia. Many of you are familiar with that. It means fellowship or association, community, communion, joint participation. It can mean all of those. And these two formerly enemies, the Jews and Gentiles, were now reconciled and brought near by the blood of Christ. Now we saw in the Old Testament, if we're students of the Old Testament, that this was a shadowy picture that we see as we go through the Old Testament. You see Rahab the harlot, you see Naaman the leper, you see uh, Ruth the Moabitess, Gentiles that God saves here and there in the Old Testament, which is a shadowy picture of what he ultimately would do with the great ingathering of Gentiles in the New Testament. And so he would, as Ephesians 2.15 says, make one new man from these two. But now it's become very clear that God's plan for the Gentiles is fully engaged. The Jews have turned away from the Messiah, and now for a time Christ has begun this great ingathering of Gentiles. And so even believing Jewish, even believing Jews have a problem with this at times. You remember in the, Old, in the New Testament, Paul condemned Peter for playing the hypocrite when he sat with the Jews because he didn't want to associate with the Gentile believers. This is a real stumbling stone for Jews. But this mystery of salvation, which Paul is now speaking on more fully in chapter 3, comes from really two statements in the Bible. Two statements that really speak to this. Number one, salvation is of the Jews. That's what Paul says at the beginning of Romans. He says, Jesus himself says it to the woman at the well in John 4. And then the second is Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, a very famous phrase, salvation is of the Lord. So salvation is of the Jews, salvation is of the Lord. In Adam's fall, God promised a seed. The minute Adam fell into sin, God promised a solution. The first proclamation of the gospel is Genesis 3.15. I will produce a seed. He will crush the head of the serpent, yet his heel will be bruised. That's the promised seed. Later to Abraham, he promises a seed. He promises land. He promises blessing. But he promises a seed, an heir. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And then if you think about it, just to be brief, that seed had a seed that had a seed that had a seed. And we trace that seed all the way through the Old Testament. And then Paul comes to Galatians chapter 3 and he says this in verse 16. The promises spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed seed that is Christ. And so that promise of that seed in Genesis 3.15 is finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Jews misunderstood this Old Testament promise in a sense because they thought it was exclusively Jewish. They thought it was because of their tradition, their oracles, their heritage, their Jewishness, if you will, that it was automatically their possession. And really, if you think about it, that's what people do today with heaven, don't they? Stop somebody on the street and say, are you going to heaven? Have you any met, have, has anybody in here ever met anybody that said they're going to hell? Anybody ever said that to you? I haven't. Heaven is something that's a right for the world. That's where they're going, of course. They're not perfect. Every now and then you meet somebody that's that arrogant. But for the most part, people aren't perfect. But they're going to heaven because God can't not have heaven without them. 
And so it's sort of like the same with the Jews. Because of their Jewish lineage, they were going to be saved. Well, Paul is preaching this mystery about the unity of the Jews and Gentiles, and it was the stewardship that he had that he took care of based on the ministry that God had given him. And he talks about this in greater detail in Colossians chapter 2. But look at verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This word manifold in classical Greek has the idea of a beautiful embroidered um, pattern. A tapestry is the word I was looking for. And so it's this beautiful tapestry that God is weaving together in the manifold wisdom of God. God wasn't just going to save Israel. He was going to save men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Many colors, many nations. Look at all of us in this room, all different, from all different backgrounds, all different heritages, and yet God brings them together. This is the manner of the church. This is what Paul says when he speaks about the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God, both Jews and Gentiles, fellow members of the same church. And this is the tapestry that he's weaving that we call the body of Christ. And yet what's more is this beautiful tapestry that God is weaving together is a stage for who? Look at the end of this verse. The rulers and the authorities. This is the angelic host. These are the angels in heaven. We are on stage for them. They are observing the church. Peter uh, wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Here it is. Things which angels desire to look into. The angels are amazed at God's redemptive economy. That God has saved a sinful people for himself. And they have been observing this for centuries. MacArthur says this, The church does not simply exist for the purpose of saving souls, though that is a marvelous and important work. The supreme purpose of the church, as Paul makes explicitly clear here, is to glorify God by manifesting His word before the angels, who can then offer greater praise to God. End quote. And so, because there's so much misinformation, just two seconds on some angelology. Angelology. Most of us don't think about angels, but Paul brings them to the center of the focus here, and they're all part of God's plan for the church. They're all part of His eternal purpose. We know that from Isaiah chapter 6, angels reside in the very presence of God. Daniel chapter 10 talks about the fact that the Holy angels are at war with the sinful angels, the fallen angels, the third that fell with Satan after the fall. We know from Luke chapter 2 and Hebrews 1 that they praised Christ at the birth of the Messiah. They were present there. We know that they were present at the empty tomb. They have a special interest in the church, as I've been saying. Even an obscure passage in 1 Corinthians 11 where it talks about head covering for women it says, because of the angels that are looking upon us. And so they have an interest in what we do here. They rejoice at the salvation of sinners, Luke chapter 15, verse 10. And throughout eternity, they will join us in singing praise to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Revelation chapter 7. And so what we do here matters. And it matters because we're on stage in part for the angelic host. Verse 11. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice the words eternal purpose. This is the third time Paul speaks about that. He is saying God's decree was eternal and unchangeable. When we think about God, we, we think about two types of things. We think about his will of decree and we think about his will by precept. God's decretive will is like a king. It's an edict that we're not privy to. Why do all these things in the world happen? Most of them are in God's decree. They are not for us, as Deuteronomy 23, 23 says. Those are for God and for the things of God. That's his decree, his ultimate plan. 
But what he has made known to us is his preceptive will. His preceptive will. And that's what you hold in your hand. This is what God wants us to know and wants us to be concerned about. Deuteronomy 23, 23. The things that are hidden are for God, but those things that are revealed are for us and for our children. We don't need to get our knickers in a bunch about what we can't understand. We've got plenty to say grace over and what we need to learn. And that's God's perceptive will. But he's talking here about his eternal purpose. And one of those, as we're talking about this morning, is the church. Notice this decree is carried out by Jesus Christ, our Lord. This decree is for the kingdom of Christ, and it's for the body of Christ, the church. Literally here in the Greek, it means this. This is what verse 11 could be rendered. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed. That's a better rendering of what the actual Greek would say. In other words, this does not relate solely to the execution of the, of the decree, but to the appointment itself, which was known only to God. That's the mystery that Paul now, now says has been revealed. It's like parents keeping secrets or keeping things from their children for a time until they're able to understand. My kids are probably smiling and laughing right now. God's eternal purpose is to sum up all things in Christ. He is the centerpiece of all of history. All of the Old Testament points forward to Christ. All of the New Testament is summed up in Christ. And all of history will climax upon the return of Christ. We come to verse 12. In whom we have boldness and confident access in Him. This word boldness literally has the idea of freedom of speech, unrestrained speech, fearless confidence, cheerful courage. Don't mistake boldness for presumption. Those outside of Christ are in presumption to think that God will answer their prayers. The Bible says the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God. He may, because of his grace, answer them, his common grace, but he's not duty bound. And so don't mistake boldness for presumption. We who are born again have gone from fearing God as if the mountain were on fire, like Sinai, to now having God as Father, that we can cry to Him, Abba, Father. Literally, the idea there is Daddy. My kids don't fear coming to me with a question because they have access. They are children. I am their Father. And so we do too. We now can boldly walk in where Christ has provided access. And we have confidence, not in our own merit, but in the merit of Jesus Christ. He is the infinite and perfect Savior. And notice Paul says this is through faith in Jesus Christ. Never forget, faith itself doesn't save. Faith itself doesn't save. Faith is a conduit that appropriates the act on the cross. The cross is what saved. Faith appropriates what took place there. Many people have faith, but faith, remember, is only as good as its object. You have faith that that chair is going to keep you from hitting the ground. That doesn't save you, but that's faith. You have faith when you go to a pharmacy and take a pill, it won't kill you. That's faith in the pharmacy. But faith in what Jesus Christ did on your behalf on the cross is what saves you. And so Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 22 the author to the Hebrews says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. John Calvin on this verse says something I really like. To separate faith from confidence would be to attempt to take away heat and light from the sun. Isn't that good? Faith and confidence go hand in hand. Prayer is certainly part of God's plan for the church. He calls upon God's, he calls upon God's authority and brings on his rule over the earth, over the spiritual forces, and that's one of the reasons why we at Trinity Bible Church of Dallas want to make corporate prayer part of our very DNA. It's important that we pray. 
later in Ephesians chapter 6, he's going to talk about the full armor of God that we can stand against the wiles of the evil one. Paul calls us to pray for all the saints so that the gospel may go forward. And so we saw Paul the minister. We see Paul bringing to light the mystery, number two. And finally, number three, we see Paul's motive. Verse 13, Paul's motive. Therefore, I ask you to not lose heart at my tribulation on your behalf, for they are your glory. We see the verse... In verse 13, this reveals Paul's motive for bringing up the matter of his own personal situation. Notice the pronoun there, my. These are my tribulations. Did did Paul suffer for the gospel? Boy, no one suffered more than Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul gives the litany of the things that he suffered. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Paul says this, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more so. In far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, Dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is a daily pressure upon me concerning all the churches. Who is weak without me being weak and who is led into sin without my intense concern? Paul knew what it was to suffer for the gospel. And he says to them, I don't want your sympathy, Ephesians. I'm not saying this for sympathy. He said the same thing to the Philippians. But I want you to be more bold for the gospel because of what I endured. And that's what he says to the Philippian church in chapter 1, verse 14. Because of my chains, most of my brothers and sisters have become more bold and confident in the Lord and dare all the more to preach the gospel without fear. And so the Ephesian saints were not to be discouraged by his imprisonment, but rather to take courage knowing that his suffering was for their glory. Why? Because his suffering led the gospel which led to their conversion. And so let me bring this to a close. Number one, Paul wants in this passage to elevate our understanding of the importance of God's plan for the church so that we will give it the proper priority in our life. In two weeks, there's going to be a wonderful man come preach named Stephen Cole. Many of you maybe have heard of him. He was a teacher for years at Flagstaff Bible. He just retired last year. He'll be here in two weeks to preach. He says this, quote, Many Christians don't commit themselves fully to the local church because they're too focused on themselves, and they don't have the big picture. The church is at the center of how God wants to change the world. It is His eternal purpose to display His manifold wisdom through the church. We should respond by committing ourselves to it and be praying for God to use it mightily. We should be willing to endure hardship to see it become all that God wants it to be. End quote. And can I just say amen? In our consumer-driven society, we have too many people walking through the church door, walking through going, what can the church do for me? When your Savior came to earth thinking, what can I do for them? And that's the way we need to think. That's the way Paul thought. Paul was all about others. Number two, every saint is a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaim the unfathomable riches of Christ. We have the cure for cancer, spiritual cancer. Number three, like Paul, we proclaim a mystery that's now been revealed in the New Testament. There is no more mystery. We know what God's plan is. And if you look, you can look at this later. If you look in Revelation, it's easy to remember. These 
these uh, verses, the, the verses in the chapters are not inspired, but I often wonder in God's providence how beautifully he done, he's done this. Because in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, Revelation chapter 11, verse 9, very easy to remember, he talks about the fact that the lamb was slain and he redeemed to God by your blood men out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We can be so myopic, and I'm speaking to myself, we can be so myopic about what we're doing here that we forget God's great plan everywhere else around the world, knitting that manifold wisdom, that tapestry together from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And finally, we need to follow Paul's example. We need to follow Paul's example. He told the Corinthians in chapter 11, verse 1, follow me or imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul suffered for others. Paul suffered for the gospel. Paul suffered for God's glory. And he did it because he had a focus on God's great eternal plan. As I was preparing this message, this seemingly insignificant event came into my mind and I thought I'd close with this. I worked with a man years ago, was one of the wonderful bosses that I've been fortunate to have. I grew up working at a golf course, you know, shining shoes, cleaning clubs, running carts. But the golf pro that worked there was a wonderful man who taught me many things. Keep your nails clipped and clean. Keep your shoes shined. Those are the two things I look for when a guy comes to hire or a guy comes for a job. Excellent lesson. One of the things he taught me, though, seemingly so silly, was how to carry a cup of coffee. He loved to drink coffee or even soup. And I remember coming to his pro shop one day getting him a cup of coffee from the other room and I came into the pro shop and my hand was like this and I was looking at the coffee. Well, the more I looked at the coffee and walked, the more the coffee spilled, right? He said, Matt, let me show you something. Took the same cup of coffee, which was a little bit less full now, and he grabbed the saucer and he raced around the pro shop at a very brisk pace and the coffee was as still as a sea of glass. And he said, here's the difference. The more you look at the coffee, the more your hand's going to shake. But if you look straight ahead and you don't watch it, it'll stay as calm as can be. You see where I'm going? If we look at our tribulations in this life, and don't get me wrong, I get upset as Tommy Nelson says when I miss my turn in the revolving door, okay? or somebody cuts me off on the freeway. But the more we look at our tribulations, the more volatile and tempestuous they look. But if we can keep our eyes focused on God's eternal plan, and we can look heavenward while we're going through those tribulations, it'll seem so much calmer. That's what Paul wants us to see in this text. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the Word of God. We're grateful for what you can teach us through these words. We know it's inspired because the Holy Spirit makes application of that to our hearts. It's self-evident, self-authenticating, infallible, inerrant, and it's all-powerful. And we're grateful that this is the true living and abiding Word of God. Lord, may you sanctify us by your truth. May you help us to live as Paul did for others, as our Savior did for others, to be servants in a lost world. Lord, I pray that if there are any here or any listening who do not know Christ, that you would give them no rest and give them no peace until they find peace with God. And then might you give them the peace of God. And we'll ask it in your powerful and mighty name. Amen.